Hi, this is Steve Bartlett, and man, am I excited to be with you today and have this opportunity to teach you how Jesus won souls. Could you imagine being in a seminar where you could actually watch Jesus hit the streets? What did he do, and how did he do it? How did he lead and guide a conversation, and how did he steer a person that had no real inclination to God at all? And, and literally, a half an hour later, they're giving their entire lives to the living God. Well, in John chapter 4, we find just such an encounter. And I really believe it is God equipping us to do evangelism even more effectively than we could have ever dreamed up on our own. And I want to take you through an outline here that I have led thousands of Christians through. And I've heard hundreds of times after we've gone through this, wow, that makes sense. I never realized how simple it really is. And you know what? It really is simple. So let's begin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some of this. I have it written in your outline. I'm going to have to read some from the Bible so that you can catch the context with me. Let me ask you, how did Jesus win souls? What's the first thing he did? Well, I've listed it here in your outline. Point number one, he simply contacted somebody in a social venue, in just a normal, everyday situation. I can't tell you how many Christians I've met that could talk to anybody about anything that now all of a sudden they're going witnessing and they begin just to freak out because they're all concerned about what they're going to say and how are we going to have a conversation. Listen, relax. You know, for, for 30 something years, I've been training people on how to win the loss. Can I give you a key thought? Just chill out and enjoy the opportunity to go meet someone and talk to someone. And this is what Jesus did. Here in, in John chapter 4, let me read this for just a minute. The Bible says in verse 3, He left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. I mean, that's just basic geography. He's got to go through Samaria to get where he's going. And he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob, uh, where Jacob's well was, where he had given it to his son Joseph. And Jesus, being wearied from his journey, sat by the well. And it was about the six hours, about 12 o'clock noon, high noon there. And he sees a woman. And what does he do? He talks to her. Listen. You're never going to lead anyone to Jesus until you talk to somebody. I know that sounds crazy, but it's that simple. Start a conversation. Jesus sees her, and he's weary, and he says, give me a drink. Could you imagine that at this time in history? Here's a Jewish male talking to a Samaritan woman. What would most, in fact, almost all of the Jewish males done? They would have ignored her. They wouldn't have talked to her. In fact, when you look at this story, Jesus' disciples are in this city all day long. And do we have a record of them talking to anybody at all? You know, if we're not careful, we're going to so compartmentalize our lives. Where when we're out in public, we're so busy, we're so focused, we don't take the time to recognize anybody, to value anybody, to even talk to anybody. The other day I was on the street and I saw a guy literally walking away from me and the Lord spoke to me very clearly to go talk to him. And I did. And I ended up buying the guy a sandwich. And we sat down and we talked and I shared the gospel with him. It was a phenomenal opportunity. You know why it happened? Because I took the time to talk to him. Guys, this is where it all starts. How many of you could just go talk to someone? 
That's how evangelism takes place. And notice what Jesus does, and I've listed it here in your outline. Point number two, he establishes common ground with her. What do you think the common ground is? They're both thirsty, and they both need some water. Could you imagine that? Jesus found something to talk with this woman about. The fact that they're both at a well that's hot, I mean, it really makes sense. Water is the most natural thing to talk to somebody about. I remember many years ago, we had a bus on a, on a trip down to Fort Lauderdale that broke down in front of a bar. And I walk into this bar, and I had some of my friends with me at the time, and I notice as I look around, there's all these pictures of Greece on the wall. There's the Parthenon, and there's Athens, and there's the Oracle at Delphi, and just all these pictures of Greece. And ah, in my lightning-fast mind, I realized the bar owner is a Greek. Well, I've been to Greece, so what does that mean? I've got something to talk to him about. And what do you think happened when we sit down and I just mention to him that I've been to Greece and I can see all of his pictures of Greece? For the next half an hour, we talked like we were old friends and I steered the conversation to God. But how do we start the conversation? I had to go and just talk to him, and I had to find some common ground. I wonder how many of us could find common ground with people. Some of you are sports fanatics. And you see people with a, with a sporting, you know, like a Denver Broncos jersey or a Steelers jersey or a Cowboys hat. Do you realize you instantly have something to talk about? Your love for something that you have in common here in this world. This is exactly what Jesus does. Give me a drink. The disciples had gone away. You can see this in your outline. And the woman says, how is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink? That's amazing. The Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Well, guess what was greater than their racial you know, disintegration and tension here that day. Both of them needed a drink. I'll bet you we could get past a lot of our, a lot of our divisions if we deliberately looked for common ground. And notice what Jesus does. He arouses her interest around that common ground. Listen to his statement. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would give you living water. Is it possible to take natural water and natural thirst and begin to turn that to arouse her interest and in a sense gauge how much interest she has by taking it from the natural realm to the spiritual or the supernatural realm. Water, in Jesus' mind, can become living water that I can lead her and guide her in this conversation, not just to think about her natural desire for water, but to give her water while she'll never thirst again. Living water, Jesus brings up for the purpose of arousing her interest. And listen to what happens. Listen to what she says. Sir, you have nothing to, to draw with, and the well is deep. Where are you going to get living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank it from himself, his sons, and his livestock? Jesus said, and listen to this. He's arousing her interest. And guys, this is how we do it. He's arousing her interest. Jesus said, whoever drinks of this water is going to thirst again. But of the water that I give, you will never thirst. And listen to how Jesus phrases this last part. The water that I give in him will become a fountain of water that springs up to everlasting life. Let me ask you something. How do you go from water to living water to a fountain that springs up to everlasting life. And does she, does she express an interest in this? Are you kidding me? Look at her statement. Sir, 
give me this water that I may not thirst nor have to come here to draw. Jesus has drawn her in. He talked to her. He established common ground and he aroused her interest. Listen, how did Jesus win souls? He found common ground to talk to people about. Did he take normal, natural things like the wind and like shepherds and sheep? And I mean, think of all the illustrations, grains of wheat. He, he's, he's connecting with people at where they live. And in every case, he's turning that conversation to eternity, to the spiritual realm, to the things of God. Some of you are fluent in housewife, in auto mechanic, in, in masonry, in building, and you could take a normal, natural conversation and steer that conversation to the things of eternity and arouse their interest by the very things that you share with them. He took the natural need for water and turned it into supernatural water. And he mentions God to see where she is in the conversation. Listen, at first this may be awkward for you, but once you start doing it, it'll be as natural as anything else you do. I can literally talk about food, children, camping, life, the love of the outdoors, and turn every one of those natural topics to the eternal realm and to the things of the Spirit of God and mention God and mention eternity. I love to go camping with my sons. We've been to Yellowstone National Park many times. How many times do you think I've run into bikers and campers and people that are out there to look at nature and I just start a normal conversation about how beautiful all of this is and then ask them, where do you think it came from? And suppose I could tell you about the God that created all of this beauty. You know, I don't think I've had five people and hundreds of them shut down the conversation and not want to hear about the God that created such beauty. You know what people are fed up with? Us coming with our, you know, our religious lines and just hammering them with our presentations and not making it real for them where they live. Jesus doesn't have a script, doesn't have a gospel presentation. He sees a woman, and he connects with her, and then he arouses her interest. And it's amazing. If you and I will do the same thing, we're going to have the same kind of results. You know, there's so many questions, and I've, I've listed just a few of these here. What do you think God wants for us, or even from us? What do you believe? I love to ask people that. What do you think about God? Once I've taken a normal conversation and aroused their interest, I'm not just here to hammer them with a presentation. I want to ask them what they really believe so that when I say something to them, I'm going to really speak right to where they're at in their heart. Think about that. You could do this. You can ask them, are you interested in spiritual things? Or what do you think about religion? That's how I got the guy in the, in the Greek owner of a bar. What do you think about, you know, the religion here in the United States? Do you think he had an answer? Come on, guys. What does that mean? I run into people all the time with a T-shirt or some kind of jewelry, and some of it's a little crazy. I know exactly what it means, but I want to ask them what it means to them. I saw the other day a guy had a crystal on, and he was telling me it was the most powerful thing in the universe. He was testifying about how his crystal gave him power to live his life. And I remember asking him, do you want to hear about the guy who created the very crystal that you think is so powerful? And it was amazing. He didn't shut me down. He wanted to listen. I tell you, if you'll find common ground with people and arouse their interest, you're in in that you're having a conversation that opens the door for you to present Christ and testify about what Jesus has done for you. Look, this is how Jesus did it, and it's how you and I can present the gospel as well. 
Now notice what happens here. This is my, my fourth point. Jesus gets what we call a word of knowledge. Could you imagine? We could do the same thing. I just took a young woman, a woman with us, on our trip down to Las Vegas. We had 30 people in our team. She was not comfortable at all doing evangelism. In fact, she'd never ever gone up to someone and deliberately tried to present Christ to them. And I asked her, what are you comfortable doing? Well, what do you think it is? She's learned to hear God's voice after all the years of walking with God. She's in her 20s, and she's learned to hear God's voice, worshiping God as, as a young person and as a member of the youth group and then as a member of the college uh, campus ministry. She's read the Bible and spent time with the Holy Ghost, and she's got herself in tune with the Holy Spirit. So what do you think happens when she goes out on the streets and doesn't try just to present some awesome evangelistic presentation, but she just connects with people and then tries to listen to what the Spirit of God says to them and says to her about them? She literally led, I don't even know, possibly a dozen or more people to Jesus, just being sensitive to what the Holy Spirit gave her to tell people right there on the strip, right on the parks, right out where the people are. I'm telling you guys, a word of knowledge is normal. But listen to how I phrase this in your outline, because this is very important. Don't condemn them. Bring them to a realization that you are a man or woman of God, and that you're there with good news for their life. This is what a word of knowledge in evangelism, this is what makes it so powerful. I'm not here to condemn them. I'm here to make them aware that God is reaching out to them through me. This happens literally to me all the time. I'm asking God to show me something about this person's life, and God does it. And notice who did this? Who operated this way? It was Jesus. Listen to verses 16 to 19. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman says, I have no husband. You know the story. Jesus said to her, you've well said you have no husband. You've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. In this, you've spoken truly. And notice what the woman says. Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. What's she really saying? There's no way you could know that about me by sitting here at a well and asking me for water. In other words, God Almighty is using Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit is working through him to touch this woman's life. And you know, guys, that's normal witnessing in the power of the Spirit. And if we'll be sensitive to what God is giving us to share with people, man, I have seen this over and over and over again. And I just want you to know, Jesus doesn't condemn her. He heightens her awareness of her sin and her need for a Savior. That's loving, compassionate evangelism. Don't condemn people. If you get a word from God, don't beat them up with it. God is reaching out through you to save that soul and to set the captives free. I call this the art of evangelism, highlighting her need for God and her need to have her sins forgiven. You know, it's amazing. Many times you don't even need a word of knowledge. People will just come right out and say, man, I'm a sinner. I've done this. I've done that. I've done the other. But with a word of knowledge, you just reinforce the fact that it is God reaching out to them through you. And I'm telling you, you can. Jesus said this in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. And I want you to know you can hear his voice and you can allow God to work through you to save eternal souls. Man, this is awesome. 
I've given you some, some verses here to think about. I mean, think of the love of God, where the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.19 that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them, and he's committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. Could you imagine that? You know, when I tell people, listen, God isn't counting your sins against you. I've had some of them that they don't know what to do. They want to have an argument to try to defend themselves. And when I just let them know, listen, God isn't holding any sin you've ever committed against you. Many of them don't even know what. I've had them cry on street corners and park benches when I don't condemn them, but I make them aware of their need for Jesus. And I'm telling you guys, this is the art of evangelism. Loving people so much that even when you have a supernatural revelation into their past and into their hurt and into their pain and into their sin, that we don't use it to condemn them, we use it to set them free. Amen. That is awesome. We're all guilty. We all need a Savior. And, and this, is, this is so powerful. This is what Jesus does. He stays on track. Listen to this. The woman tries to get the conversation, in a sense, off track. Her very next statement is, Our fathers worshipped them this mountain, and you Jews say it's Jerusalem that we ought to worship in. What does she want to do? Have a, a, a discussion about the racial differences and the religious differences. Jesus wants to keep the conversation on track. It's her need for a savior, her need to have her sins forgiven. She wants to have a conversation. I run into this all the time on some peripheral issue that has no real basis of her eternal life. And Jesus just brings it right back to it. Listen to this. Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming and now is where the worshipers, it's not in this mountain or, in, you know, some other place where we're going to worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is of the Jews. The hour is coming and now is where the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. And those that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman says, I know the Messiah is coming. Jesus looks at her and says, I who speak to you am he. What's this fifth point? Stay on track. Don't let them sidetrack you. But number six, bring them to a decision about what they're going to do about Jesus. And see, this is the key of how to close the deal, in a sense. It's not that we're going to just talk about all these peripheral issues. I want them to realize they need to make a decision about Jesus. How did Jesus do it? He forced her to make a decision <coughs> about who he is. I who speak to you am he. This is evangelism, preaching Christ, bringing people to a point where they have to make a decision. What do I believe about Jesus? I've listed some of the statements here that I use sometimes to sort of lead them into this commitment. What do you really need to change to get to know God? Everybody knows in their heart what they need to do, what they need to change, what they need to stop, what they need to start. Maybe someone doesn't, but I run, almost everybody I run into is literally one good confrontation away from giving their lives to God. You can ask them, would you like to know that your sins are really forgiven? See, I'm going to bring them to a decision to call out to Jesus I love to ask this question, would you like to become a real Christian, a real Christian, not a religious hypocrite, not somebody playing a game? I tell, listen, I'm not here to give you fire insurance. Do you want to get to know the living God and be a real Christian? Are you going to spend eternity with God? That's a great question to, to, to gauge where they're at. See, I don't like to just say, man, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? There's some creative ways that you can do this and bring them to a realization that I have to make a decision about Jesus. 
You know, I hear all the time people say he was a good teacher. No, he's not. He's Lord and God of all. The only way to get back to God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of great religions in, in that sense of the word in this world. Religions will give you a, a, moral, a morality code to live by. They'll give you an identity. They'll give you some something that make you feel good about yourself, something to meditate on. But you know what no religion on earth will do? Bring you back to the Father. See, that's a relationship with God, and that's what real Christianity is all about. No one comes to the Father but by me. No one is going to be restored to the Creator except through Jesus Christ. I'm not here to put any religion down. I'm here to magnify what Jesus Christ did and bring people to a decision about Jesus. And then I just want to real quick give you, give you three truths that, 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 that really help make this thing come alive. Again, I've already quoted one of them. In John 10, 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I love to ask people, do you hear God's voice? How would you like to? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. If you're being honest today, and I've, I've asked this hundreds of times on the streets. Do you hear his voice? Do you know his will? People say, well, not really. I feel like I'm separated from God. That's exactly right. And Jesus came to bring you back to him. Are you ready for that? And I'm telling you, they are. They just need you to lead them in it. A second great, I call these proofs of salvation. Is found in Romans 8, 16. The Bible says that the Spirit himself will bear witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. I, I run into people all the time that have no assurance of their salvation, no idea if they're really going to go to heaven or not. You know why they don't have that idea? Because they don't know. They don't have the assurance. But when you're born again, this is the truth. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. You can use that to bring them to a commitment to Christ. And thirdly, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I love to ask him, has your whole life become brand new? And you and I both know the answer. Almost all the time, as well, no, it never really has been. I've just sort of been religious. I'm living my life the way I always have. Well, I want you to know something. When God comes into your life, everything becomes brand new. And listen, I love to say, are you ready now to really call on Jesus and give him your whole life? Guys, in the last month, I probably led more than a dozen people to Christ just out on the streets, and that's what I get to. I establish common ground. I arouse their interest. I stick to the main point. I bring them to a decision about Jesus, and I prove to them because they know in their heart, one way or the other, if they're really saved, really a Christian or not, and then I drive it home and I say, are you ready now to give your life to God? And the truth is, I've had, again, thousands over the years right there on a park bench, right there on a beach, right there on the streets, call out to the living God. You can do the same thing. And notice, lastly, I'm, gonna just, I'm out of time, but I want you to hear this. Jesus goes to Samaria and spends two whole days with those people. Do you know why? Because he loved them. If you and I care about the people we minister to and, and lead to Christ, take the time to help them Get started in their relationship with God. Don't just abandon them. Get their name. Get their number. Shoot them an email. Do a Bible study with them. Go visit them. Take them out to lunch. Do whatever it takes. That's how we built Abundant Life back in Chicago. Going and connecting with people. You can do the same thing. Hey, listen, I'm out of time today. God bless you as you reach out in God's love to lost and hurting people.